Hi everyone, today we're going to talk about invertible tensors, uh, the inverse of an invertible tensor, the determinant of a tensor, and the cofactor tensor associated with second order tensors. So a tensor S, boy, suppose I said the word tensor a whole lot there, huh? A tensor S is invertible if there is another tensor, which will denote S superscript minus 1, such that S times s minus 1, or s inverse, is equal to the identity. If we write multiply both sides <coughs> by, or rather left multiplying, couldn't uh, tell my left from my right, I guess, when I was writing the notes out, huh? There we go. All right, so left multiplying both sides by S inverse. Since it's inverse times the identity <coughs> is equal to S inverse, um, then it's going to follow that this part here has to be equal to the identity tensor. Which is to say that, um, you know, if S times S inverse is equal to the identity, then S inverse times S is equal to the identity. So S is equal to the inverse of S inverse, if it exists. <coughs> If V is a three-dimensional vector space with an inner product and a cross product, then the following four statements are all equivalent for any tensor S in lin V, which would mean <coughs> if any of the four is true, then all of the four are true. <coughs> So the first is S is invertible. <coughs> the second is that S times U is equal to vector 0 if and only if <coughs> U is equal to 0. So these first two don't really require it to be an inner product space. That should be 
vector zero there. <coughs> These first two don't require it to be an inner product space or cross product space or three dimensional or anything. These are always going to be the case. And then the next two are going to require it. Well, let's see, the third is going to be applicable for any finite dimensional space. For any basis <coughs> U, V, W, um, then S, U, S, V, S, W is also a basis. And four. <coughs> this one is definitely only a three dimensional one that has the cross product. S U cross S V is not equal to zero <coughs> if and only if u cross v is not equal to zero. <coughs> so in other words, if u cross v is 0, <coughs> then either one of them, well, yeah, u is a scalar multiple of v, in which case it's 0. And then in that case, of course, su cross sv would have to be 0 no matter what. But um, if u is not a scalar multiple of v, then u cross v is non-zero. <coughs> and this is saying that it can't collapse, you know, a space spanned by u and v into a one-dimensional space. So it can't, you know, <coughs> collapse a plane into a line, essentially. <coughs> if two tensors are both invertible, then we have the usual relationship between the inverse of their product and the product of their inverses, which you would have seen from matrix algebra. It'll end up being the same formula. So the inverse of s times t is equal to t inverse times s inverse. Um, and we can show that by just multiplying them together. Well, we can regroup things, uh, change the parentheses around since the order of multiplication here is still going to be left to right. And then this part here is the identity. So this is equal to T <coughs> inverse identity T, which is equal to T inverse T, which is equal to the identity tensor.
Uh, consequence of this is that the inverse of s times s is equal to <coughs> s inverse times s inverse and so that's equal to s inverse squared and so a consequence of this is that for any non-negative integer m we have the mth power of s the inverse of that <coughs> is equal to the mth power of s's inverse um, for all m in 0, 1, 2, with the understanding that s to the 0 is uh, the identity. Let's clean up this minus 1 here. Since the trace of a times b is equal to the trace of b times a, like this, uh, it follows that the trace of s times t times s inverse so we're going to consider this our a and s inverse our b <coughs> is equal to the trace <coughs> of s inverse times s times t the s inverse and the s just become the identity, so that's equal to the trace of t. If s is invertible, then the transpose of the inverse has to be equal to the inverse of the transpose, and we'll just denote that s superscript minus t. So this colon equals is, is defined as <clears throat> Say we have an orthonormal basis and an invertible tensor. Then we know that we have S <coughs> equals SIJ EI tensor EJ in components. And S's inverse is also a tensor, so we can say S inverse is equal to S inverse IJ. E I tensor E J. <coughs> so S 
times S inverse is equal to S I K uh, E I tensor E K. We picked K here because we're going to want the J on the next one. And then times S <coughs> L J E L tensor <coughs> E J. So picking uh, you know K and L here, and then I and J here um, was strategic because we're going to want <coughs> SIJ, SIJ at the end, or SIJ. S-I-K-S inverse K-J um, at the end there. So, you know, getting it all <coughs> set up the right way to start is going to be helpful. <coughs> Otherwise, you end up having to move indices around. Um, but, of course, when you're doing something, proving something for the first time, you're always just going to kind of do the steps and then clean it up at the end. And then if you're trying to, say, teach it or write about it, you'll redo the process to make it a little cleaner. All right, so we can then, you know, move the uh, scalar components to the front, and there's going to be this EK dot EL, EI tensor EJ. <coughs> I've got an inverse there. Then we got E K dot E L E I tensor E J. All right, well, that is equal to S I. K S inverse L J delta K L E I tensor E J <coughs> which is equal to S I K S inverse K, J, E, I, tensor, E, J. <coughs> but S times its inverse is equal to the identity, which is delta I, J, E, I, tensor, E, J. So the components here have to be related to delta. Wow, oh, that's not a very good looking delta. You could almost mistake that for an S. There we go. S I K S inverse K J is equal to delta I J so that the components of a tensor's inverse are the matrix inverse of the original tensor's components um, when they're expressed with respect to an orthonormal basis. <coughs>
<clears throat> All right, let's do exercise one from section 2.9 in the textbook. So we want to verify for u dot v not equals to minus 1, that the tensor 1 plus u, or rather the tensor identity plus u tensor product v is invertible with the inverse given by this formula. All right, so there's the formula. <coughs> there we're saying that the inverse of 1 plus u tensor product v is 1 minus u tensor product v divided by 1 plus u dot v. So here, uh, this part is scalar. So it's just the reciprocal of that scalar there. <coughs> well... Easiest way to show that this is the correct inverse is just to multiply them out. So we got the identity plus u tensor product v. Identity minus... 1 plus u dot v, <coughs> all underneath 1, times u tensor v. All right, do the old FOIL on that. That's equal to 1, and then get a minus so it's the identity minus uh, 1 over 1 plus u dot v u tensor v and then plus u tensor v, so that's the inner ones. <coughs> and then the last ones, so minus 1 over, that's not a good 1. And then u tensor v times u tensor v. like that. <clears throat> All right, so we can group together the terms that have this uh, 1 plus 1 over u dot v in front of them. This is going to be equal to 1, well, the identity tensor, rather, plus u tensor product v. minus 1 over 
1 plus u dot v <coughs> times u tensor product v plus the square of that. All right, well, that's equal to identity plus u tensor v minus same thing u tensor v again <coughs> and then plus well we can combine these two and that's going to be u dot v u tensor v which is then identity plus u tensor product v minus and then we see that we can factor out <coughs> a u tensor v from this last term here so it'll be 1 plus u dot v u tensor v <coughs> so of course these two will cancel out and that is equal to the identity plus u tensor v minus u tensor v which is equal to the identity and so we verified that that is the correct inverse um, so I went through that you know in order to demonstrate it <coughs> And the first time, you know, when, when you don't already know where you're going, uh, you know, you go in a few circles and stuff that's going to happen. And, you know, it even does for me now. So the first time that I did it, I probably had about three times as many lines, and most of them didn't go anywhere. So, you know, don't, uh, don't get too discouraged if you find yourself going in circles. It's sort of the way of things. And you just... Um, keep working the, the problem until you get <coughs> where you need it to be. And then you can tidy things up at the end. <coughs> All right, now on to the determinant of a tensor. In general, the determinant's kind of a nasty thing if you want to <coughs> define it in the same way that we've defined <coughs> things like trace where it's in a way that's intrinsic and not relying on components. Um, you end up having to do all sorts of exterior algebra nastiness with the wedge product and, you know, skew symmetric forms and everything and we really don't want to deal with that within the uh, the context of this class um, and we don't really need to um, we're always going to be concerned with R3 unless we're talking about the space of you know solutions to the equations the differential equations that we're <coughs> going to set up but at any rate you don't really need to worry about defining the determinant of tensors in arbitrary vector spaces. So one that works for a three-dimensional vector space equipped with a cross product is um, the determinant of a tensor <coughs> is defined to be equal to the ratio of SU dot 
SV cross SW over U dot V cross W whenever U, V, and W are a basis. You recall that for a basis, uh, u dot v cross w is non-zero. Uh, for any basis, it happens. It can be proved, in fact. Um, we're not going to bother with it here, but the ratio. SU, so the ratio that we're using to define the determinant can be proven not to depend on the choice of basis. So you can prove that to yourself, or if you look in the book, you see that they reference a uh, <coughs> an old advanced calculus book. You can probably find that one in the library <coughs> if you want to see the proof to it. <coughs> All right, so given two bases, um, And so two bases can always be related to one another by a tensor, right? If you have a basis and another basis, you can define a tensor that maps it to the other. Uh, the two bases have the same orientation if the determinant of S is greater than zero. <coughs> If u, v, and w is a basis, then u dot v cross w is not equal to zero, we've said. So um, SU dot SV cross SW 
is not equal to zero if and only if SU, SV, and SW is a basis. which is to say it spans, <coughs> you know, a region having non-zero volume. Um, so it spans, you know, three-dimensional space and not a plane or a line. So IFF here is if and only if. if I've mentioned that already. SU, SV, W. In which case, the determinant of S, given by this formula here, would be non-zero. And S would have to be invertible. So S is invertible <clears throat> if it maps a basis to another basis. Therefore, S is invertible if and only if the determinant of S is not equal to 0. All right, there's a couple of useful properties of the determinant that are <coughs> listed in the book. The determinant of the transpose of a tensor is equal to the determinant of that tensor. The determinant of the product of two tensors doesn't depend on the order, and it's equal to the product of the determinants. This one is only <coughs> for three-dimensional space, but the determinant of alpha times a tensor is equal to alpha cubed times the determinant <coughs> of that tensor. Um, so in, in general, it would be alpha to the n, where n is the dimension of the vector space. Finally, if S is invertible, the determinant of the inverse is the reciprocal of the determinant of S.
Now we'd like to be able to calculate the determinant, so let's <coughs> go into how to do that. So if we have a positively oriented orthonormal basis, um, then we can calculate it pretty easily from the components of S. So we have that E1 <coughs> dot E2 cross E3 is equal to 1, <coughs> which is also equal to E2 dot E3 cross E1, which is equal to E3 dot uh, E1 cross E2. <coughs> then the determinant of s is equal to s e1 dot s e2 cross s e3 since the denominator in our expression for the determinant would be this, which is just 1. <coughs> and it would also be equal to <coughs> any even permutation of 1, 2, and 3. You know, so, so if this was e2, e3, e1, then that would still be equal to the determinant, or 3, 1, 2. But if it's an odd permutation, it would be minus the determinant. So 1, 3, 2 would be minus the determinant <coughs> because the denominator would be minus 1, and we've eliminated that because <coughs> you would have to permute the denominator things as well. At any rate, um, because of that, we have, if we multiply this thing here by epsilon pqr, Or rather, we we can we can express all of those different combinations in this PQR, you know, so three by three by three list of equations. E P Q R determinant of S <coughs> is equal to S E P cross S E Q dot S E R <clears throat> All right, so that is equal to S I P E I cross S J Q E J <coughs> dot S K R 
dk. And so this comes from, um, you remember, the ith component. is equal to e i <coughs> dot s e p which is to say that s i p is the ith component of s times e p which is where these two <coughs> not immediately apparent um, expressions came from. All right, so then we can do the cross product and use our chronicler, or rather our alternating tensor, symbol, alternating symbol, that's the one. Uh, that is equal to E I J K so the alternating symbol comes from the E K, whoopsies the ek dot ei cross ej bit <coughs> since that is equal to epsilon ijk and then we get s i p s j q s k r so then since um <coughs> E I J K E I J K is equal to six. We have the determinant of S is equal to one sixth E I J K E. P, Q, R. So basically we multiplied both sides through again by P, Q, R. And then divided by 6. S, I, P, S, J, Q, S, K, R. That one there is not a very good looking Q. <coughs> All right, so that was it for the determinant. Now on to the cofactor of a tensor. So the cofactor of a tensor is denoted S superscript C, if the tensor is S. And it describes how the area spanned by two vectors transforms if the two vectors are transformed by s.
so the cofactor is going to exist regardless of whether s is invertible but in order to calculate what it is it's going to be useful to restrict our attention momentarily to s that is invertible so let's say that we have an invertible s and two vectors u and v such that u cross v is not equal to zero so one isn't a scalar multiple of the other <clears throat> All right, well, since S is invertible, <coughs> it follows that SU cross SV is also not equal to zero, since it can't map a non-zero vector to zero, and it can't map two vectors that are not aligned with each other to a line, or it would not be invertible. S U cross S V is not equal to zero. So we're going to let N equal S U cross S V. And we know that N is not equal to zero since N is just this thing that we said is not equal to zero. In fact, n is perpendicular to both SU and SV. <clears throat> so it is the area normal to the, um, the parallelogram spanned by SU and SV. All right, well, it's perpendicular to SU and SV, so N dot SU and N dot SV are both equal to zero. And we can use the definition of the transpose to say then that um, S transpose N dot u is equal to zero and s transpose n dot v is equal to zero so n is perpendicular to s u and s trans and so n is perpendicular to s u and s v and S transpose N is perpendicular to both U and V. <clears throat> well, in three-dimensional space, that means that S transpose N is equal to some scalar multiple of u cross v, right? Because u cross v is the <coughs> is a vector in the direction perpendicular both to u and v. So S transpose n has to be some scalar multiple of that, and we'll figure out what that gamma is. Well, 
Well, by definition, n is su cross sv. So we can say s transpose su cross sv is equal to gamma u cross v. Let's pick w equals u cross v so that uvw is guaranteed to be a basis since u and v are linearly independent. And examine taking the inner product of both sides of this with the vector w. All right, so we'll write that out. W dot S transpose SU cross SV is equal to gamma times w dot u cross v. <clears throat> well, we can take this s transpose here and use the definition of transpose to make it an sw there. Dot is equal to gamma w dot u cross v. All right, well, we've shown that w dot u cross v is a basis. So we can divide both sides by it. And we have that gamma is then equal to the determinant of s. So if we go back here, S transpose SU cross SV is equal to the determinant of S, whoopsies. Right here is what we're looking at. So S transpose SU cross SV is equal to determinant of S times U cross V. So we can multiply through by S inverse transpose. If S is invertible. So S doesn't have to be invertible for there to be a cofactor matrix, but it does have to be invertible for this to be equal to the cofactor matrix. So it's equal to the determinant of S, S inverse transpose U cross V. So this whole thing here is one formula for the cofactor matrix of S. However, we can calculate the cofactor tensor of S, not matrix, um, 
even if it's not invertible. And we would actually typically calculate the inverse or the inverse transpose from the cofactor tensor there. All right, so if we have ourselves, again, a positively oriented orthonormal basis, Then one of the identities from chapter one, uh, we have EJ is equal to one half EJMN EM <coughs> cross EN. So let's clean up that M so you don't mistake it for an N. There we go. All right, so the ijth component <clears throat> of the cofactor matrix with respect to an orthonormal basis can be found the standard way. It's equal to EI dot cofactor tensor acting on EJ, like that. <coughs> All right, well, we know we can substitute this expression in for EJ. So that is equal to EI. Dot. cofactor tensor, and then one half epsilon j m n e m cross e n. And we can move the epsilon and the half outside is equal to one half epsilon j m n e i dot s e m cross s e n. So the next step that the textbook takes here is worth examining more closely because it's not really immediately obvious. So, you know, they make a substitution. We'll kind of change the, come on, and do it. There we go. So we're going to ask ourselves a question. Uh, the next step in the textbook is only correct if E I dot any vector U cross any other fixed vector V. Uh, it's only going to be true if that, so put a little question mark here, is equal to E I K L. E K dot U <clears throat> E L dot V. Well, we didn't really um, have any sort of formula that necessarily said that's directly the case unless you happen to see something right away, which sometimes you see something right away, and it makes perfect sense. Um, but that one to me, you look at it and it's like, well, it's not the, directly the same as any of the formulas that we have before, so let's check it out. All right. Well, we know that this here, oopsies.
So this here just has to be UK, the kth component of U, and this has to be VL. All right, well, looking at these components, we see that's the ith component of u cross v. And you would get the ith component of u cross v by taking u cross v and dotting it with ei, since the eis are an orthonormal basis, so that is equal to u cross v dot ei, which is the same as over there. So sure enough, the next step does check out that, you know, you can take um, this part here and replace it with what, uh, what happens next. All right, so then this is all equal to do this. Um, the ijth component of the cofactor matrix is then equal to one half. E J M N Epsilon I K L E K dot S E M E L dot S E N. And there again, I want to make that one a more obvious M. All right. So then, um, if we look here, this is going to be S K M, and this will be S L N. So that is equal to one half. Epsilon I K L Epsilon J M N S K M S L N. So we know that the inverse. <coughs> so this this formula here gives us the components of the cofactor matrix, or yeah, well, the components of the cofactor tensor relative to <clears throat> our orthonormal basis. <coughs> and it gives us those components, um, and therefore a way of constructing the cofactor tensor, regardless of whether S is invertible. But if S is invertible, then we can construct its inverse from the cofactor tensor as the inverse of s is equal to 1 over the determinant s <coughs> times the transpose of the cofactor matrix, or tensor again. Don't know why my brain is uh, shutting down today, but of course it's a tensor. <coughs> All right, so then um, S, the ijth component of S inverse relative to our EI tensor EJ basis is equal to one half 
times 1 over the determinant of s. And then we got epsilon i, k, l, epsilon j, m, n, <clears throat> s, m, k, s, n, l, like that. So that's how we find the components of the inverse in three dimensions um, using the determinant and the definition of the cofactor tensor, um, where the cofactor tensor's components are given by this part right here. All right, so um, you know now that we got over the the vector space stuff, which was not in the textbook, um, everything else is pretty well in the textbook. Um, might add, you know, a little bit of further explanation here or there. Um, if you guys would prefer, you know, this will follow the textbook pretty closely. Um, if you think it'd be more useful, you guys can just read the textbook and the lectures can be more running through examples. Um, I leave that up to you. You know, people learn different ways. Um, but I figure on doing it mostly this way, probably run through generally a few more of the examples in the textbook, but otherwise, you know, follow it pretty closely and just expound upon things a little bit um, and run, run through some of the examples. All right, I think we'll have two more lectures on tensor algebra. There'll be one on um, orthogonal tensors, so rotation ones, unitary that would be called. Um, and another one on spectral theory, so eigenvalues and eigenvectors, uh, and that will be specifically on the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of symmetric tensors, which makes matters a whole lot easier since the eigenvalues are all real. And then from there, we'll start on the, uh, on the differentiation of vector and tensor fields and integral theorems. All right. Have a good one, and I'll get the second homework posted pretty soon here. And once you guys turn in your final corrections tomorrow, I'll get those homeworks graded. Have a good one.